is very, very important too. And radio music does not tend to be the best. You know, nice, good stereo and connecting with what you know um, that person's uh, uh, experiences in life and where they came from and their interests, jazz and or, or rock or, or what have you, or classical. So it's not necessarily one size fits all and keep that in mind too. I also like to think about music because I think that no matter where you're at with the disease that um, there's a lot of power behind it. I uh, spoke with a couple maybe a year or so ago that said they used to go out dancing quite a bit together and that getting out into uh, some of the places in public where they used to dance was becoming a little harder and more challenging to coordinate and they couldn't always arrange it with their friends but they were able to incorporate music into their evening routine and lights and candles and have a little bit of wine as Cynthia said earlier um, and dance together and really have a very intimate uh, rich emotional exchange with each other in ways that they might not always be able to do and as the relationship might change for them they were still able to stay, stay very connected um, through the power of music. So how many of you use music in your uh, daily routine whether you're in the home or in a care setting because I recognize okay great a lot of you perfect and you use it in a really thoughtful kind of planned way right I realize that I'm speaking today to um, individuals and folks who are just starting out um, with memory loss, and if this may be your, your partner or your parent or your sister or a close friend. Um, and then I'm also speaking to people today, too, that are coming from community settings of different levels, but for people that may have been living with the disease for a long time. So I'm hoping to sort of just plant some awareness and some insight, and likely for many of you, as I see when I walk around at what you're offering in your communities, um, some validation and affirmation behind what you're doing. Uh, and so you, you all raised your hand that you do use music pretty much um, almost every day. So Because I like to think of it this way, it's a little differently. You know, how many of us take a pill every day in the morning or at night, right? Okay. So if we think of music as an equally powerful kind of medicine, wouldn't we want to have that in the morning and the evening too, perhaps? and maybe even three times a day. I'm sorry, I keep leaning into this microphone, but after I'm wired up here. Um, I just realized I was doing that, and it's not having any effect. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll get used to it here before I'm done, probably. Um, but, you know, at the power of music, it is medicine. Music is medicine. Consider incorporating it in really thoughtful ways. Not once, but twice, maybe three times a, three times a day. Um, in the same ways that we would, um, other things that we don't like to swallow, maybe like pills, right? Okay. So, who inspires you? Um, I like this slide because it just shows so many different people, and I know you may not be able to see it from the back, but you've got your slides and stuff. And I, when we use the word activity, I think, you know, it sounds kind of very surface oriented. It doesn't sound like it has a lot of depth. So every time I want you to start thinking of the word activity, instead of sort of maybe an older way you would have thought about it, I want you to say, think that activity equals purpose. And that purpose for each of us is very different. And you know, purpose is something that drives us. It's something that makes us happy. It's something that gets us out of the bed in the morning. It's a force. It's a sense of pride. It's why we feel content why we feel connected, and why we sleep at night. It's as individual as our fingerprint, and yet it makes us something, part of something much, much bigger. And so I want you to always be thinking, you know, when I'm creating activities, whether it's in the home for myself and my partner and family member or in a care home, what's the purpose behind this? We don't want things to just be passing time. They need to be really connected quite individually with our family member and the individuals. And as you can see from here, so many different things inspire people. Music, God, a beautiful morning, beauty, rhythm in all different forms. My wife, riding my bike, playing pickleball, spending time with my grandchildren, being with people and helping others. So many different things for each of us as individuals. You know, we sometimes get sort of homogenized into 300 people living with memory loss or something in this room, but we're all very unique individuals and purpose drives us in different ways. All right. 
This next slide is about person-centered care and really kind of treating the whole person. And as I think someone said in the early stage panel earlier, you know, we don't have a lot of physical effects to the disease sometimes, maybe until later on. And so it's really, really, really important to know an individual's, what we call sometimes as recreation therapists, sort of life story. And I would say to our early stage folks, start writing it down now and you tell us your life story. It's your chance to tell us what are you proud of? What have you done in your life? What do you feel most connected to? Um, you know, what do you want everyone to know about you? And those are the life stories. Those are the things that we get to celebrate. But person-centered care, and I love the statement, it's important to know what person the disease has as, as opposed to what disease the person has. I think in our medical model, we tend to define people by what they aren't able to do, right? Or by their precautions. And I think a good example of that um, is this. Um, there's a 72-year-old woman that I know who has a hip fracture and she's a risk to falls. Um, she uh, was diagnosed with dementia about four years ago and she's on medications for high blood pressure, arthritis, has restless leg syndrome, and is often awake at night. Okay? That's a very medical model-focused description of someone, right? But I would, if I was to think of opening the door to the real life story, the way I would prefer to introduce my friend first, and the way I would prefer people to know her first is, her name is Tessie. Her name is Tessie Davis. She's a 72, year and I've adapted the name. She's a 72 year old woman. She grew up in Brooklyn, New York. She immigrated there when she was six years old with her parents. She's always loved and been very involved in theater, almost all of her life. She's also a retired geriatric social worker. She loves strawberry ice cream. Her favorite flavor is orange. She loves to perform for people, and she is known for her Tessie Davis smile. Now that's what we mean when we talk about person-centered care. And you have to know those things first. If you don't know a little bit about someone you're working with, and you may be thinking, well, this is my family member, so I know a lot about them, or this is me, I know a lot. But we also equally in that place need to share these things with other people who may be connecting with our family members and to be our own, create our own testimonials around that, right? Around what we want people to know about us. Because if we don't, it's really sort of like, and especially as the disease may advance, and people cannot tell us all the time of what their life story is, right? Or they may get disconnected from family or someone very important like that. It's really like imagining you were treating someone on dialysis and never looking at their chart. If you don't know someone's life story, what their purpose is, what their accomplishments are, what makes them tick, how are you gonna do? what you really need to do for someone, how you're really going to be able to connect with them and get to know them and become their friend, right? Because that's really what it's about. And it's equally as important to know those things as it is to know medication someone's on or blood sugars or any of those kinds of things too. And I encourage you as a care partner to think about if you were to ever have someone coming into your home to do things with your family member as well, that we make sure we convey all of those things. Because otherwise it's like driving in the dark at night without our headlights on, right? It's reckless. We wouldn't think of doing something like that. But we often sometimes, I think, forget to convey the value of those things and that life story and those accomplishments and that connection to purpose. Um, and and it's, it's equally as important as whether this person needs to take medications three times a day too, right? So hopefully everyone's able to kind of recognize that with me. So whole person needs really is just kind of a formula. I wanted you to give, an, uh, give you an idea of you know, what keeps us and makes us all whole. And to think about it for your own self. Like there's maybe sort of a small little draw when you go home tonight or next week, sort of a, a circle with kind of a little pie chart. And think about yourself or your family member or someone you may be working with. And you know, what, what, do, you know, what do you know about their life story? And then what do you know about their routine? What routine currently exists and how might you want to influence a daily, a weekly, or a monthly routine by knowing sort of what drives them. Some people are far more spiritual or religious than others, right? I'm less religious but spiritual, but I don't go to church every Sunday. I prefer to walk in the woods. That's my sanctuary. So knowing that about me is very important, right? And what part of that sort of makes me up, makes me whole, if you will. Um, I'm also very physical, 
So if I'm inside all day and I can't get access to the outdoors or I've lost my ability to drive and get myself places or to get to the woods, right, to be in my sanctuary, it's really important for you to recognize the essence of who I am as a physical being as well. And how, and I listed, of course, because we're all so diverse, lots of different ideas for what can comprise something physical is a little bit more obvious, but what can comprise social domains and needs of us as individuals and what can comprise uh, the cognitive domains for us and emotional and spiritual domains. But, you know, sort of look at your own pie of life, if you will, and decide, you know, what are the things that are important to me and how am I doing those in my daily and weekly and monthly routine? And then you can kind of convey that exercise to, um, to your family member or to individuals that you might be working with in a day setting or something. But I think the most important takeaway is just to know that everyone deserves the right to have exposure to all of these things, cognitive, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and these are the things that make us and keep us all whole. And so as a good partner or a friend, we want to make sure that we're always staying true to that for our family members. And you're also kind of a thread, you know? You're the thread that's connecting and tying people together. So we know everyone living with memory loss, they may have memory loss, but they're each unique individuals with their own personality. You're really kind of the key to untapping that. Um, again, as a family member or a good friend or a sister or a care provider, we're the key to tapping and untapping that. And you're gonna, I, I say sort of keep the faith because I think a lot of times through our experience with these things, we're going to have some uh-oh moments in the process of what I like to call discovery. And has Tifa Snow ever um, performed in here? Okay, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm grading way low for her today probably, but on my book of dancing, she's a, a, a wonderful instructor and performer as well. But I, I borrowed from her the aha and the uh-oh moments because I like those. And I think that we have to go through a lot of uh-oh moments as we're learning um, to get to the aha moments of discovery, right? And I also put the word in sustaining in this title because, you know, if you are a care provider or you're a family member and you're thinking, gosh, you know, I can't be the cruise ship director too. I'm already handling finances and lots of other things. I can't do this. Then I invite you to look at resources in your community. This community is very rich in a lot of diverse resources. And people on your team, or as Susan Harvell, who lives in the early stages, would say, you know, I need a lot of people in my tribe, Dale. So, you know, who do you have on your team and in your tribe that can help you do these things? You certainly can't do them all yourself as a care partner, right? But how can you accomplish these things so that we help our family members as they may lose the ability to drive or organize some information or have more advanced needs? You know, who else is going to help them be able to tap in and discover who they are, and to find kind of the thread and the activity and the routine that keeps the purpose and the connection in your life. Um, the last ones down here are sort of really, if you feel like your well of empathy and love and understanding or respect or playfulness or encouragement is low, you really need more people in your tribe, right, and on your team to help you with that. It's okay. We all have those moments and we can only support so much. And this goes for family members or whether you're a paid professional in a day program too. But we need to make sure that we or someone else can bring those kinds of things every day into the life of our family members with memory loss. Empathy, love, understanding, respect, playfulness, encouragement. You know, they really do all convey positive intention. And, um, and, and we need, you know, and if we aren't sincere with those things, people will know it and sense it. And we can't even begin to connect without them. And the last one is kind of an acronym, uh, PATH, which is um, uh, really, a, they came from a family member. And she said she found that these, this, this kind of acronym really helped her and that these were sort of for her the four most essential qualities as a care partner. Um, and I would say also for someone as a, as a paid care professional too. And I heard it on the early stage panels uh, time after time. I heard it from you all. Attitude, you know, was the big one from you all. But our own patience and attitude, tolerance, and then I also heard humor quite a bit. You know, those are really powerful things that no amount of money can buy, but they're really, really powerful and critical. And we're all hardwired a little differently. So if you don't have a humorous or, or a good attitude or something like that, find other people on your team who do that can help us um, get to where we're trying to go. 
with meaning and purpose and sustaining ourselves for the long run uh, through this disease with, with building and quality of life. So what happens when we create a really good, how many of you feel like you have a good daily, weekly routine down now? Okay, it accomplishes things, it gets things done, you check some things off your list, but you're also saving a lot of time to do the things that you really enjoy doing too, that really add to your quality of life. That's the tricky part, right? Yeah. It's time can really get away from us with the to-do list, okay? But when we're able to accomplish this, there are so many different kinds of benefits that come from it. Strengthens a sense of self and community, okay? Promote simple choice, feelings of positive self-worth, improved mood, reducing a person's stress for yourself as well as our family member with memory loss. We, we build increased feelings of security when we have a sense of meaningful routine, right? Um, lots of times people don't feel really secure from day to day with their memory loss. It's a very, right, it's like I look to you guys a lot, but it's kind of left foot, right foot, and you're always trying to anticipate sort of what's coming next. But, but creating um, routines and meaningful engagement reduce the anxiety and the frustration that a lot of our family members might see, and also the depression, right, and by being able to connect and contribute. They promote relaxation, sleep, and reduce restlessness. And I know Dr. Landsberg is going to talk a little bit later about medication, so maybe we're building good ground for each other here. Muscle tone, balance, and circulation, and good meaningful activities foster laughter, joy, success, and quality of life. So what kind of medication are you aware of out there that does all of that <laughs> with no side effects, right? It'd be hard to find, wouldn't it? I'd love to put that in a pill. But we've actually got it in a pill, so to speak, but it just comes in a different form, doesn't it? Okay? So that's sort of the message I'm trying to convey there. And contented involvement is also sort of the philosophy we call um, that means to be sort of that in the moment, that really calm, familiar, relaxed state of mind, right? I call it sort of like wearing a comfortable pair of shoes. It's not too tight. Uh, they're not new shoes that are squeaky. I'm not trying to walk in high heels. It's that comfortable pair of shoes that we're trying to create through our activities. So not something above somebody's ability level that creates anxiety or stress or something that quizzes them or reminds them what they're not strong at or talented at, right? But something that focuses on what they are good at and remaining abilities and creates that sense of familiarity and engagement. Okay? Crafts don't always do things that are sensible, I think, for people with memory loss. Sequencing gets very difficult, so I just wanted to sort of reinforce that. Sometimes I think we're getting away from that a lot, but if you go to kind of traditional crafts where one step is built upon the next, that's not always something that I would pull out as being sort of making sense to someone uh, with memory loss, and it can create a little bit more confusion than what we, we would expect, but we can also turn it from an uh-oh moment into an aha moment, right? So the contented involvement is a place that we're always sort of working towards this kind of feeling, right? And the atmosphere can certainly influence that. And it's often not about the bells and whistles. Um, I, I use for myself, um, and it'll be different for everyone, the kind of contented involvement for me, at least during the work week, is coming home in the evening. Because contented involvement in activities can mean active or passive, right? But for me, it can mean coming home taking off my shoes, <laughs> maybe but not putting on any shoes, but at least some comfortable ones, sitting on the back porch, putting my feet up, grabbing a book of some short stories that don't take too much uh, time and effort and cognitive uh, reserve to process, right? Sitting out there with a glass of wine or a, a glass of sweet tea. I'm from the South, so sweet tea is very familiar to me. Um, and just kind of sometimes reading a bit and maybe seeing if one of the hummingbirds come down the light on one of the the plants in my garden. That to me is also an example of contented involvement, but yet a very relaxing kind of passive way. So it's not always about the bells and whistles, right? And you may very well be already creating those kinds of rituals for contented involvement in your home already. And if you are, I salute you. And if you aren't, and you find that the list of to-dos is outweighing those kind of contented involvement experiences in the moment, then I would say, you know, put a little bit less to do on your list or bring a few more people into your tribe, okay, and onto your team to help you do this. So these are examples, too, of what could contented involvement mean outside of the example I gave you. And there are lots of different examples, I think, there. And I, I know you all have these slides on your, um, 
and your handouts, so I won't uh, go into detail about that. But I just wanted to sort of give people the idea that it can, contented involvement can convey a lot of different things. If someone is anxious and unsettled by something we were trying to create as contented involvement, that's an uh-oh moment that we can learn from and say, oh, wait a minute, we don't give up on that completely, but how do we need to sort of reconsider it or shape it? Maybe it's not so familiar, maybe we need to go a little bit more slowly, okay? But it's often just about those very rich in the moment experiences in life. And then I just sort of, over the years, a few things to um, consider, I think, is that, and I mentioned the sense of routine, and many of you said that you do have that, that you know, creating routine and repetition is a really good thing. That promotes familiarity, it promotes a sense of purpose. And I call this thing sometimes the zen of sweeping, because it sounds like, oh, it's sort of mindless. Actually, sweeping is great therapy for me when I'm very anxious or worried about something. I can go out and sweep the driveway forever, and I can actually sort of work through a lot of worries that way, right? Um, but people, even in the earlier stages of Alzheimer's, they want to be very engaged, and they want to be helpful. And often, sometimes, um, like, let's see. Somewhere. One of the women on the panel <laughs> uh, mentioned, don't tell me that I forgot to push the button on the toaster, right? You know, just do it for me. Um, but really, what we want to do is find things that people are able to do successfully in the home. And it's often sometimes related to your to-do list. It's all the things that you might not want to spend your time on, but someone with memory loss, and certainly in the earlier stages, a woman in our support group said, I like to empty the dishwasher, empty and load the dishwasher. I want, I want to feel helpful and productive in the house. But her husband is a little bit OCD, and he always wants to come back in and rearrange it. You know, that doesn't make her feel really good, right? Um, so that sense of purpose, the things that we take for granted, because sometimes we might see those things as drudgery, are really important. And that repetitive things can be very engaging and still give us a lot of purpose. So think of all those little lists that you can't get to and try to figure out kind of a solution for your family member. And that's sort of what I mean by the philosophy of the Zen of sweeping, okay? And to think about what is your routine and how many times are you saying, thank you so much for helping me with that. I would love help with that, as opposed to, oh, no, no, don't do that. I'll take care of that, right? Which doesn't feel very gratifying to someone, especially in the early stages of memory loss, but even, even later as well, okay? People sometimes, as the disease progresses, may lose uh, initiative to begin steps. And so they often need us to model that for them. So verbal instructions, this would be way too much information for someone with more um, advancing Alzheimer's disease. But verbal, I mean, but uh, modeling something like I sort of did with my movement is a great way um, to engage someone and to also sort of give them instructions, but through motion in a way, if you will. Doing together really enhances success. And so I think a lot of times because we take activities for granted, we think that um, it's just going to happen. But um, even people, and very intelligent people with Alzheimer's disease in the early stages, they have difficulty planning things and difficulty initiating things sometimes, not all the time. But so we may need to help with those. And my point there is that don't take lack of initiation as lack of interest in wanting to do something. Uh, that's not a fair interpretation that they may just be forgetting how to begin it, and that doing things together will really promote the success of that, because they need someone, a partner, a friend, a family member, to do that with them, okay? Um, and to remember to keep it balanced. You can't do all active, active, active. We're gonna exhaust ourselves. You gotta come home and take off your shoes and rest and be in the moment. And those kinds of times are just as meaningful and promote just as much quality of life as any of the others. Pain, fear, discomfort, fatigue, all of those things can very quickly take us out of that moment and out of a really even the best of activities might not be successful with that, right? And please, if I have a really bad flu, but I might not be able to convey that to you, don't have me get up and come to some fabulous activity, even as good as it is, I'm not going to enjoy that, right? But sometimes I think we're so eager to stick to our schedule or have people be involved that we may forget those things, and also to look at things like underlying pain, um, and distractions as well. Um, TV is off and on in the background in households, and TV is, is very distracting 
um, even for uh, very intelligent people in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. A couple of exceptions to that rule, but if you have TV on, it needs to be the focus, and it's really one of your last, last things that you want to look at. But I think of TV more as distracting, particularly news and crime shows and things like that, um, that take us out of that moment that we're trying to create. So um, creativity, I just want to sort of plant a little idea because I would like to really kind of start a movement in uh, care homes and in our own homes too, is to embrace um, the potential for creativity. Um, we, a lot of times when we may have some damage going on in the frontal lobe of our brain, we might be a little bit more impulsive or spontaneous or a little less predictable, right? And sometimes that can be challenging or maybe even a little bit embarrassing. But I think the creative arts, if you will, kind of go, go out there with me for a little bit with it, really invite a lot of opportunity for spontaneity and for creativeness and for um, impulsivity, right? Someone who might have been really reserved before and not really wanting to dance or get up and perform, um, now maybe they feel like they, because of some of those changes in the brain, they have a freedom to be able to do that. They're less worried about what people think. Right? And so I want to also say that while we do have some of these challenges, and many of them are very sad to witness, I want you to kind of consider the philosophy of being able to sort of embrace that, if you will. And then creative opportunities, because it's more about the process than the end product, are really embracing of all of that, right? But it's about kind of finding the right creative moments, right? And the things that go back to the purpose that we started with that really connect with our family members. Um, Bruce Miller at UCSF, has he spoken to this group before here? But, but he profiles a lot of art in his program, and it's from people who were never talented at art before, and they're spectacular artists now. So I, I really want to sort of continue to create that movement, if you will. I think that um, a lot of potential lies in that, and whether you're creating these things in a care home, or whether you're an individual considering going out and going, well, you know, I never really painted before, or I never really went to a poetry class before, or I never really did play before, but maybe I'll give it a try now, what the heck. I would like for you all to consider kind of the potential for that and the opportunity for those new experiences, okay? And I would love to walk into nursing homes or care homes or day programs and see people doing these kind of spectacular things, right? Performing some small segment of Oklahoma, maybe. And maybe we're not reading the script, but we're, we're performing with the music or something. Or dancing to Patsy Cline, as we were, we were imagining we would do a little bit earlier. Or reading a little bit of Shakespeare. Or uh, doing some plain air art. And gardening and things like that, I think, certainly do exist. But there's no right or wrong with this. and so. I just, I just would love to see us embrace it more and more and more. And I'm proud to see, actually, several things back there. I was going to mention the collage here in a little bit. But a lot of um, certain levels of very creative experiences already being embraced um, in, in the community and in, in programs as well. And so I think just a couple of things because Quite honestly, I thought, you know, we could be all over the map with creative opportunities. And I left you with some resources at the end of the talk, too. But I really just kind of, kind of tried to grab, if you will, a couple of things with poetry and collage work because I thought that they fit for, you know, I don't know how individualized that is, right? Um, I haven't, you know, I'm not connecting it up with any one individual in the room. But I did think that they were good examples to um, think about whether someone is, again, in the early stages or may have more advanced issues and why they can be really um, beneficial to people, I think, and how we can all utilize them. So um, for the Alzheimer's Poetry Project, a gentleman that spoke to this group too, Shelley, a few years ago, yeah, he really taught me a lot about um, the use of poetry. And I thought, you know, wow, what a powerful way to kind of begin storytelling processes. Um, and uh, what a way to foster a connection with people who might not know each other, and creativeness, right, and a feeling of connection. And so, as you know, poetry you can use a lot of sort of icebreakers, but there's a lot of different kinds of poetry that we can use. Uh, poetry can be um, can be haiku, it can be cultural poetry, it can be historical poetry, um, it can be also again poetry that we might create, right? Um, and we can be very silly too sometimes. Ogden Nash and Shel Silverstein and things like that. You can do it across your kitchen table. Maybe you've never done poetry before, and you're thinking, I don't know if this really fits, but 
Dale told me to put on my creative hat, so what the heck, let's give it a try, right? Maybe Cynthia will start with her wine group in the evening and say, you know what, what kind of poetry do you guys want to start reading while we're drinking our wine, you know? Um, and so I think that there's just a lot of potential for things like that. And the recite and the recall, how many of you were here when the gentleman was from the Alzheimer's Poetry Project? Did you do that one at all? No? Okay. I'll take just a minute to give you an example of that. So, um, you know, I'll have to summarize here quickly in a bit, but I'm going to indulge for just a minute. Um, but it's a great way, I don't know most of you in the room, right? But let's, recite and recall is where you read a line and then a group reads it back to you. So that's what I'm going to have you guys do. Just a couple of minutes here with me. And this is actually a poem by Ogden Nash. So I'm going to say the line, and you repeat it back. Okay, I see some of you nodding, so it's going to keep you awake, too. Um, there is something about a martini. There is something about a martini. A tingle remarkably present. A tingle remarkably present. A yellow, a mellow martini. A yellow, a mellow martini. I wish I had one at present. <laughs> I wish I had one at present. And that poem goes on for more silliness, too. But you see right here, and many of you sitting next to each other may not know each other, too. Did you feel sort of a sense of collectivism immediately <laughs> that? I don't know if you're all martini drinkers or if you like gin or vodka, okay? But it's sort of a catalyst to bring people together. And maybe it's just a catalyst for you as a couple in the morning, and you have a, a new ritual that you start. And I'm not suggesting that everyone goes out there and does poetry necessarily. It's an idea, right? Um, but it does bring us together, and it does change our mood, and it does promote connection and silliness, right? And because of rhyme and rhythm, it promotes some recall and things like that, too. And it can be utilized in really creative ways later through discussion. What kind of martinis do you like? What's your favorite kind of? gin or vodka or something like that, right? Um, and then going on to create poetry together as well. So just wanted you to have little snippets of examples there so that if you were wanting to try something like that, um, you would feel encouraged enough to be playful in that area. And then the other piece is just about collage work. And I really don't need to say a lot about this. I think that, you're, that some of the notes that I put on there as well also, also can be done in many different ways um, throughout the disease. And, um, and uh, even you know, further on, if someone may need more uh, kind of tactile and sensory experiences and things, I think it's very adaptable to all kinds of levels. And I would encourage you actually to um, chat with the woman at the back table. Ruth, was it? Um, it's senior access. I'm not so good with my names today, sorry. Um, because they've done some collage work back there, and a lot of the things that I've suggested, you know. And um, I just think collage work, again, is easy. It doesn't require a lot of preparation. Um, it can be done individually. Um, it can be done at home, or it can be done in an art class out in the community if you're in the early stages, something like that. Or it could be done with a large group of individuals who you're trying to kind of have a common theme with in a collection, okay? And a collaboration of efforts there. Right. And if you haven't looked at their collage work, you should check it out. I even suggested that they do some sort of little sale for it. Um, I think it's beautiful work. And I think also it, um, there are the in the microphone here. Um, that I think also with collage work and artwork, that when we're able to maybe take it to another level, as we were talking about a little bit at the break, you know, we're creating these things and they're beautiful and you may decide to gift something, a piece of a collage or a piece of work you've done to someone else, but you also might decide that you're going to sell it or get donations or something for it, someone laughing at their own art ability. <laughs> um, but you can do that and then maybe you choose a particular charity or something that you, hey, the Alzheimer's Association, that you want to donate to through the sale. So there's a broader sense of connection and again, I'm not just doing these things to pass time, but I'm creating things that are personal to me, that have a sense of purpose, and that maybe perhaps make a difference to other people too. Okay? Much like our Memories in the Making, our art auction does on a, on a very sophisticated level. Okay? So I'm just going to sort of wrap up with a few things because families in the past have asked me to sort it, and I realize I'm speaking to a really broad audience of family members and care professionals and individuals in the early stages and people who may have been living with the disease for more um, many years and, and more progression and things like that. So I'll just try to do this very, 
very quickly and sort of an overview. Um, I love this statement, though, and it comes from Lisa Snyder's book, A View From Within, and an individual, um, like we heard earlier, um, expressing what it feels like to be in the early stages, sometimes, I hope not all of the time, right? Um, it's as if we were all going along quite productively in our lives until we were confronted by memory loss, confusion, nervousness, loneliness, and isolation. It's as if you're reading a book and someone has torn the pages out. So, you know, I think, and just like many people on the panel were talking about, they're such, they're full and productive and meaningful lives. I think it's our role to replace those lost pages, right? We want to put the, we don't want to focus on the missing pages, we want to replace pages. And we want to put new pages in the book, right? And we want to re replace things like loneliness with socialization and an opportunity to be around our peers and create new friends. And we want to, cre we want to take away the nervousness and the confusion, and instead we want to fill that cup up with pride and engagement and encouragement, right? So that's kind of my takeaway from this particular message, and especially in the early stages, um, I want to just reinforce that, you know, this quote came, I may be different, but I'm still me. My name is not dementia. Really powerful statements, right, by individuals in the early stages. Don't define me by my disease. Define me by who I am and the person I am and focus on all of my strengths and my power and my incredible beauty and courage, right? And that's really what it's about in the early stages. And I think that our folks, if they're not driving anymore or something like that, they're going to need a bigger, stronger connection um, with how to get around and how to plan the details. And as some people in the early stage panel said, um, math or reading depends, it's different for everyone, might affect them differently, right? So maybe um, keeping up with concepts of time and appointments are difficult, right? So we need to be able to help them with that so that they don't lose their independence, but they're able to um, be encouraged by it. But how do we go about that and sort of filling in some of the gaps for them? And it's never about doing for someone, it's always about doing with them. Right? We're never coming in to do for, we're coming in to do with and continue to focus on the strengths and the abilities and to replace those lost pages and to continue to always look for previous life interest in those accomplishments too, but also not be, to be open to new experiences. Uh, many people in the early stages talk about physical exercise and being really important with helping with some of the depression, as we heard about earlier, and the nervousness and the anxiety. And um, the next slide will talk about a lot of uh, folks in our early stage group go join the gym, or they develop walking partners, and um, that's happened a lot in the group, actually, from their, their friendships in the group, or they hire a personal trainer to help them do that, right? So maybe they can't do all of those things on their own in the way that they used to in the early stages, but no one certainly needs to give that up. There are far too many options out there in the community. And it's really, really important for people to have a sense of purpose and contribution, um, I think, more than anything else. And this is your time. If you're an individual in the early stages, this is really your time to cherry pick exactly what you want to do with your life and what you want to spend your time on, right? And it's important to tell people what's the most meaningful thing to you. Um, but to not give up on it and not hopefully feel lonely or isolated, but for us as their advocate and their partner and their care support person, to look for ways that they can continue to stay engaged by filling in some of the gaps and helping them with, not doing for, but helping them with the things that are difficult. I find that a lot of things um, uh, that give a sense of purpose, too, are, um, uh, and again, in the early stages, families, uh, individuals will talk about just kind of being home and not feeling like they really have a lot to do. But that sense of volunteerism and going back to the purpose and what really gives you your purpose and connects with who you are as a human being um, you know, we all find different ways of volunteering in what we, we take pleasure in. Um, I've heard of lots of stories of people volunteering at food banks and animal shelters and in community gardens. And um, sometimes someone might need a memory partner to help them with that, um, to be successful so that it's not stressful and, you know, they can remember people's names and things like that. But we don't need to give up on that. And especially volunteering, there's so much need in our community right now that we could fill the gap in between, right? Someone who doesn't feel um, like they are so engaged in contributing with filling a gap and a need in the community. And that's really what volunteering is all about. So those are just sort of some ideas. And don't minimize the um, value of household chores and stuff. It might be the last thing I want to do when I come home from work sometimes, but I really think, again, in the home, and especially in the early stages, that's what I hear from family members, um, 
talking about, uh, individuals talking about, gosh, I just don't feel like I can do all the same things I used to do in my home. And I'm losing a lot of my identity with that. So I, I really encourage you to look for those ways that we can continue to um, keep our family members in the early stages as, uh, as contributory and as connected with their community as possible. And I put in there the, an adaptation from a friend of mine, Chris, who's in a group, and uh, he was a longtime tennis player, and he struggled finding other people to continue to play tennis with him. And um, he, uh, so instead, I think it kind of found him one day, he was still driving and driving through the community, and uh, he looked over and thought, what are those people doing? They kind of have, they're on a different kind of tennis court, and they sort of have a different kind of pal out there. And um, he discovered pickleball. And he's got this whole new social network now. And it was similar to tennis for him. So it was that piece of creating familiarity and things that he was always, he had interest in too. But it was a great adaptation for him um, because it sort of built in a social circle for him. And it simplified it in a way that maybe tennis might have been a little bit too um, intense for him physically. So we always have a joke now. I always say, how's the pickle going? Are you still uh, getting it over the net? And they really don't play with the pickle, but it's called pickle ball. So. And then in the middle stages, um, I just want to uh, reinforce a few things that um, people may need um, more emphasis on adaptation of activity and sometimes special equipment. I, use, I like to use a lot of props. I think most good activity directors um, are really good thrift store shoppers. <laughs> and we walk around and we look for all kinds of things. And I call them props, like old hats and scarves and uh, boas and uh, recipe books and aprons and rolling pins and old vintage mustard tins and all kinds of things, right? But you can put all these things in a big box and sometimes if I was just sitting here with a group of 30 of you that I didn't even really know, um, I could pass that box around and have us each take out something and talk about it and why we chose it and how it connected with us and it would bring us together. It would be sort of a spontaneous way because I wouldn't know everyone. Um, but, but often my point is that props can be a catalyst and I've been known to take out a pink polka dotted scarf and have someone who had very advanced verbal abilities say, that looks like the scarf that my mom wore on the 25th wedding anniversary. Or that's the hat, looks like the hat that my dad always used to go to town in. So I think a lot of times that they're sort of a vehicle, and we, I use the term connect and find the thread that connects, that props and things like that can do it, and a lot of emphasis um, even more so in the, uh, in the middle stages. Keep things simple, limit your kind of verbal cues more in the middle stages. Um, choice, we don't want 10 choices. Ordering from a menu might be more difficult for someone in the more middle stages, but choice is really important. I don't want to just hand someone a cup of tea, right? I want to know, do you, would you like uh, chamomile or orange spice? You know, what if you all walked out there today and you got to pick, you didn't get to pick lunch, you had the same thing and someone just gave it to you, you know? You can see the difference in too many choices, but some choices, usually a couple in the middle stages, are really important to quality of life. When you feel like you might not have all the choices you want anymore, those kinds of things become very significant. So I would encourage you um, to make sure that we're not just doing things for people, but we're engaging them even in the simplest of choices that someone might make in their routine. Um, be cautious about safety things and really careful about minimizing distractions. Um, can be, uh, they're difficult for me now in my life, distractions or noise outside of an activity or something I'm trying to accomplish. But even more so in the middle stages, again, the TV being on or something loud outside of the house or what have you can be really distracting and take someone out of the moment. And they can't filter that in the same way that you and I can on most days. And then I've just got a piece up here about the late stage support. And I think I would just sort of summarize that because, you know, I would say, you know, what's most important if all of you were out there thinking that we, um, you know, might have a year or less or a couple of years or less or something to live. And maybe we couldn't convey to everyone what we always wanted. Um, I heard in conversation the other night that someone in early stages had actually, you know, created uh, uh, a note to family members about what they wanted and what was important to them. And I thought, wow, how insightful, how courageous, how powerful to be able to tell someone, look, if I could only count on four things every day, here's what my list would be, right? 
So we often have to do a lot of sort of self-reflection. And I think that in the later stages, security, comfort, simple pleasures, and validation that we use through storytelling and reminiscing. You know, I remember when you used to take me to the fair, and we had such a great time, and bought cotton candy, and, and uh, corn dogs, and you know, those are very validating. And even if you think someone in the late stages might not be hearing it, they are. They're hearing it, and more importantly, you're sharing it and saying it out loud, too. So that's the biggest message I want you to sort of come across with. My, I think my late stage end of life uh, wish would be um, dark chocolate uh, many times a day. Forget the medications because, you know, if I only have a couple of years left anyways, they're probably not going to do me any good, right? Um, some good music that you know that I enjoy and I connect with. People that are familiar and safe and my family and friends uh, around me, right? Maybe my, my dog, Belle, my border collie by my side. And, um, and massage, a hand and a foot massage, every morning and every night. <laughs> that would be on my wish list, you know? So I hope and I, I keep glancing over to our family members in the early stages and I think, you know, what uh, courageous people they are. Sorry, I get a little emotional when I think about it, but you know, to sit here and just be open to so much information and um, to help us understand how the disease is, and for me to sort of, you know, fast force you through uh, some of these changes that may we don't know may or may not occur, right? But I also hope that it's inspiring to you to know that people care um, a lot about all of those stages of your life. Excuse me, and um, care enough to be open to them, to explore new ideas to make sure that we're always connecting with the whole person and the essence of the person. And that, you know, at the end of the day, it's really not about the to-do list. It's really about the connection and being in the moment. And those are the kind of memories that all of us will cherish. So I hope I have conveyed that to you today and I um, appreciate uh, your time and attention and thanks very much.